Hi, welcome back. Okay, so now we're getting to the part of the series where we're going to build a couple of projects. So we're going to start off with the instrument project, and once we complete that, we'll do the effects project, and then after that we'll look into compiling and all that sort of stuff to actually turn them into plugins. So let's create a new project in High. So I've got the welcome wizard here. I'm going to click create a new project. And this is going to create it in my documents folder in a High's project subfolder. And I have this set as my default location, but you can choose a different location if you prefer. I'm going to give the project a name. I'm going to call it Rustic Violin. And we'll click create. Okay, let's take a look at the project folder that High's has created. So we'll go to documents and we'll go to High's projects. And there it is there, Rustic Violin. So this is very similar to the project folder we looked at in an earlier video. Let me just center this on the screen a bit more. We have the same sets of folders, but most of these will be empty. If we go to the scripts folder, there's nothing in here yet. If we go to the XML preset backups, there's nothing in here yet. So let's get highs to populate those folders. So we're going to go to file, and we're going to go to save XML. Click OK. And then it goes to the XML presets backup folder. So I'm going to call this rustic violin. So I usually give my XML the same name as the project. And then I'm going to go to File and Save Archive. Click OK. And Heiz has automatically saved it in the presets folder and it will have the same name. So let's open that up and take a look. So first of all, the XML preset backups, we can see it's created the XML and we've got the UI data XML as well. And in the presets folder, we can see the HIP file has been created and an auto save has just popped up as well. Okay, so the next thing to do is to set up our project preferences. So we'll click the cog wheel and we'll check the name of the project. So it's rustic underscore violin. I don't want this to actually be the plugin name when it's exported. I want it to be rustic violin. So I'm just going to change that. We can start with a version one release. That's fine, but we could change that if we wanted to. So a little explanation about these version numbers, just in case you're not familiar with them. This system of versioning where we have a number dot number dot number is called semantic versioning. And each number represents a different thing. So the first number is the major version number. So for version one, two, three, etc. of your project, that's going to be the first number. The second number is the minor version. So maybe you're releasing version 1.5, 1.6, that kind of thing. So you would put that second number there. And the last number is for patches and bug fixes. So you might have version 1.5 bug fix number six. Or you might have version 1.5.50 for the 50th bug fix. So because these are different numbers, you don't have to roll over to the next digit when you get to 1.9. So it doesn't go 1.9 and then 2.0. That's not how it works. You could have 1.10, 1.11, 1.12, etc. Because these are each just individual values that have individual meanings. They're independent of each other. Then we can add a description for our project. So I would just put a simple violin sample library. And then you need the bundle identifier. And this is quite important, uh, especially on Mac, because Logic and other hosts have different ways of identifying plugins to make sure two plugins with the same name aren't going to conflict and that kind of thing. And this is given the format of a reverse URL. So you would have com dot whatever your company name is dot the product name. So for this one, I might put com dot Librawave dot Rustic Violin. Something like that. Then you have to have a plugin code and it has to have this format, a capital letter followed by three lowercase letters. And there isn't a universal system for this. It's kind of up to you to come up with your own internal system. But again, its main purpose is to stop two plugins conflicting. So with my plugins, I start with an uppercase L and a lowercase W. So that's the LibraWave. And then I use two letters that kind of represent what the plugin is. So this one's Rustic Violin, so I would put RV. And if I was to release another plugin in the future called, um, I don't know, uh, Rustic Viola, then I would have to change this. Maybe I put RA or something for the Rustic Viola so it doesn't conflict with the Rustic Violin. So it's just important that this is a unique plugin code within your collection of plugin codes. Obviously, another developer might have made a plugin with the same plugin code, but hopefully they've got a different bundle identifier, different version number and different name. And that should prevent any conflicts there. Okay, we're going to leave embed audio files and embed image files enabled. Usually you'd want to leave these enabled unless you have a lot of images or a lot of audio files that you want to ship separately. And audio files here are things like impulse responses. We're not talking about samples. You want to enable full dynamics for HLAC. So HLAC is the compression format Highs uses for samples. 
And basically by enabling this, you're enabling 24-bit samples instead of 16-bit. So I just always enable that. Then there's a bunch of settings we don't need to worry about at the moment. We can choose a VST3 category. Let's see, does it have, there we go, sampler. So we'll set a sampler for this. We're not interested in any of these, but we do want to enable VST3 support. In my opinion, that should be enabled by default. So if this is disabled, when you go to export a VST from Highs, it's actually going to export a VST2. And unless you signed an agreement with Steinberg several years ago, you're not legally allowed to release VST2 plugins and they don't allow people to sign up for it anymore. So you want to enable this so that your plugin will be in VST3 format. Okay, we don't need anything else here really. Yeah, that all looks good, all looks good. So now we get to the user settings. You want to put your company name in here and you want a company code. Again, this is just another thing to try and avoid conflicts. So I might put something like LBWV for LibraWave. You can put your company URL in here. and a copyright notice as well. And this information will show up on the interface if you add an about panel to your interface. And you can also get this through scripting as well and things like that. Okay, so let's go back to our project folder. And we can see now these three XML files have appeared and this is just using the information that we've added in the settings panel. So if we were to open user info, for example, in a text editor, we can see there the company name, company code, etc. So the next thing we're going to do is we're going to bring the samples into our samples folder. So I'm just going to put this over here and open another file browser. And this one, I'm just going to go to my desktop where I put some samples already. So these are the samples for our violin. And I've organized them into subfolders based on articulation. So we've got pizzicato, staccato, and sustain. So in the pizzicato folder, we've got rustic violin, pizzicato, 55 is the note number. And it's dynamic one, round robin one. So that's how the naming works here. We've got dynamic two, round robin one, dynamic two, round robin two. So there's two round robins and two dynamics. I recommend you always use MIDI note numbers rather than note names for your samples because different systems use different note numbers for different octaves. So to a pianist, for example, middle C is usually C4, but if you're using a MIDI instrument, middle C is usually C3. And there are other systems out there as well for where middle C is assigned. But if you use the MIDI note number 60, that will always be middle C, no matter what system. So stick to MIDI note numbers instead of using note names, and it just makes your samples more universal and easily transferable between different systems. Okay, for the staccato, we've got a similar setup. So we've got dynamic one, RR1, dynamic one, RR2, and the same for dynamic two, we have two round robins. And the sustains, we have sustain, 55 dynamic one, and then dynamic two, and then dynamic three. So for the sustains, we don't have multiple repetitions, but we do have three dynamics. Okay, let's move these folders across to our project samples folder. And now I'm going to delete this one on my desktop because we don't need that anymore. I'll leave a link below this video to where you can get these samples so you can follow along. If you're watching this at Audio Dev School, then the assets are already there alongside the video. Okay, so that's it for this video. Head over to the next one and we'll start building out the module tree.